thank you very much for joining me for a virtual coffee with the editor. Today is a slightly different aspect of how we would normally do coffee with the editor. In fact, today you're going to educate me. <laughs> So I think just to give context, talk about track rehabilitation and the, the aspects that go into it and some of the considerations. And before we start, I think let's just hear a bit more about you and, and why you're a good person to tell me about these things. I'm, I'm Buti Zandberg. I'm from South Africa. I've been on the rail road now for 46 years. I've linked up with this Railnet International Group about three years ago as Director of Engineering. We're all aware that through, throughout our region, there is either consideration for track rehabilitation projects or there are currently projects that execute it in terms of track rehabilitation. So what I wanted you to take me through is, is how should an operator approach track rehabilitation in order to maximize the life cycle of that infrastructure? Some, some tracks in Africa, you, it's difficult to rehabilitate because of the condition that has been deteriorated to. And also that the gates that they're busy using at the moment or currently like the one meter gates and the one, you know, the, the old Cape gates, the 1065, and to upgrade them or to rehabilitate them and then hope to get linked to another country's line that's on a normal gauge or standard gates and get your freight down to the port is going to be very, very expensive. There's a lot of studies that needs to go into that because if you got a, a meter gauge and you do upgrade it or you do uplift it or you do maintenance on that, that's never been done for the last, I can assure you, uh, 20 years in some places, uh, then you must rather think of not rehabilitated but do a whole a new right of way. You got your right of way and I can say from my experience that Africa has got one of the best uh, compaction uh, earthworks that you can get, that you can wish for. So I think that to, to rather look into the thing as to construct what the, the main requirement will be for the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years. So I was in two or three countries last year. There is the right of way is there, but it's never been looked after maintenance wise and it deteriorated so much that nothing will help at the moment even a concession to start running their own traffic for time being to get some freight in or some get some freight out the worn on the rails and the sleepers and the broken rails and stuff is not even repairable anymore so what we need to do is take a whole view and say are we going to rather invest uh, a once-off thing that we can adopt to the, the norm nowadays of a standard gauge instead of trying to fix and then uplift later and then, you know, go into the, the standard gauge. Because it's no use you to having a landlocked country that you're going to maintain, but you can go nowhere with your freight. End of the day, what we want to do is run this whole railway network between countries down to a port to export to F, to export to, uh, to Europe and to the rest of, of the world. But it's no use you're in a landlocked country and you're sitting with all your stuff and you can get to the border, then you got to offload again onto uh, um, road trucks and stuff. That's at the present moment, it's very, very, very difficult in Africa because of the, the, the conditions of the, the roads and the time period of, you know, taking stuff that's very urgent, like fragile stuff that needs to get to big places and can't get there because of the amount of time traveling. So there's, there's different options. There is a, a maintenance is one of the most important things from day one that you construct the railway line. And this has been deteriorated. I'm, I was in two countries, like I said, I'm not going to mention the names, but you know, it, Previously, it has been, there's been washed away. They fix it temporarily, but then the second one hit them at the same place, and the third one hit them at the same place, and eventually it took the whole embankment away, and that is lying there now because, um, <laughs> because of maintenance, 
and because of not you know involving the environment people to protect that bank that washed away in the first place so then your right of way would have still been there but even the right of way like or we're taking uh, mali for instance they on a one meter gauge and now we want to construct uh, a standard gauge that's one four three five so you've got to widen your banks you've got to widen your cuttings you've got to get your your um, drainage right if you upload your your axle um, load your load per axle you got to look into the bridges you got to do your engineering studies you got to widen your bridges there's a lot lot of things to be done but i just want to bring this forward that the amount priscilla of minerals that's lying in africa we did a study in a couple of countries and um, it's worth it it's worth it hundred times more than any people will think my my feeling from from a from an african and from a, a railroad guy is that we at the present moment i think africa is running at about 20 percent production and that we want to uplift uplift to 75 uplift to 80 and it's possible if if we can get the right modules uh, down to for investment to buy into this and there's not there's not a there's no two ways about it that the financial study showed it as well that in two or three countries that we did already that you can you can if you if you go by a, a fbot you know it's like a a, a build operate and transfer module that it can be done it can be say within 10 15 20 years that loan of 30 billion dollars or whatever can be paid back they will never be there i mean the studies that they've did show you how much how much minerals are in africa and i think it's 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 amazing i'm talking about from zimbabwe through mozambique through zambia through uganda through up up right up to kenya all the way also another thing is that there are certain clusters i'm, I'm going to call it clusters like the eastern uh, uh, east africa and west africa people that is there's five countries involved four or five countries and one president said no problem the other four i will convince to all go on to standard rail and that's so hard warming uh, uh philippa it's something that see that see the future and see the 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 production up to 80 percent and see the really the upliftment so we've taken into context you know is it worthwhile the other thing that i, I want to discuss in terms of considering is it worthwhile from a you know rehabilitation or just start again is that obviously from the time that that track was initially put down to where we are today things have changed so so be it the technology the rolling stock the actual track the technology around the track as well if you had to compare for me what was and and the changes and advances ad, advances today how how is that what is that okay i'm, I'm going to start off with uh, my our own country that's also a, a good a good example of how it was done and how it should be done you know we started off in the I'm talking about uh, let's talk about the 50s 60s we were using 30 kg rails 60 pound those days uh, and then you could have up the, the 30 to 40 and you could have up the 40 to 48 you could have up the 48 to 50 kgs per meter but if you if you get to that stage that you're sitting with a, a rail like i'm talking about uh, um, countries up in africa that we did the feasibility studies and you sit still sit with 40 feet rails like 12,192 or 30 meter 30 feet rails 9144s you got you got so many uh, uh, joint fish plated joints and because of no maintenance those joints has been broken out and it's you can't replace anything in that rails space because on the on the on the sleepers that they are sitting there there now because you can't put a bigger rail onto it won't fit onto there so what should have been done after five or 10 or 15 years all depends on the increase of your tons per axle 
you should have up up you know and 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 the, up the, the the system for to accommodate for your more freight that's going to move over that line and that's never been done um so now what 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 the norm is nowadays if you want to get a lot of minerals out to the port you need to run it at least about 30 tons per axle and those old railway lines and they were they were built for about 14 tons per axle that means you you can you can load about say uh, 42 minus about 12 say about 30 tons in one truck and that's about the amount of one rail one road truck that's running and you can put 40 wagons on there so you can have 40 trucks rolling at one time but the the material has has been so deteriorated you won't even get that old um, railway lines like the british standard and like the crook and like the uaca from south africa the strongest steel that anybody can wish for i wish i can build our rails with that with that type of rail but in a, in a bigger format um, if 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 it has been upgraded and up to 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 to, to cover your your ton axles it would have been right but now you can't Philip. the one thing that that's that's the problem now you're sitting with a, a a non-existent railway line you can't use because of all the wear and tear on that railway line you can't you can't gamble because if you go with the first train and you got a derailment then you can close the rail down again. that's what happened between uh mali and xenical uh, like I told you about the washaways, they did it the first time, they, they fixed it temporarily, it happened the second time, they did, fixed it again, the fourth time it was totally washed away. But what they should have done is get the environment people many years ago. I mean, you know, that this, this right of way has been built, say, in, in, in the 1920s, 1930s. And it's excellent. I mean, that, that Africa's uh, formation and stuff is one of the best that you can get. But it's, it had to be looked after because now your rails is getting, you know, nap joints, you're getting knocks on your rails and you're getting broken rails and stuff. You're not only damaging your, your ballast profile and your sleepers, you, you're damaging your whole profile, your, your earthworks, everything. So that is the main thing. Now that we want to up to, to a standard gauge, we've got to widen that bank's we got to add onto the side of the banks because your railway line is wider, about 400 millimeters wider. Uh, your, 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 your ties, your sleepers are so much heavier. Your rail and, and, and you got to add a lot of ballasting. Also, we've picked up some on feasibility studies that even with a 14, 14 ton per axle, you got your damage on your culverts and stuff. And also your bridge has got to be getting road, uh, load bearing tests to see if they can carry heavier loads. So it's a total re-look at the whole system, what needs to be done. But it's no use, you, you try to, to, to bring the, the, the lower grade in or the lower standard in to adhere to the big standard that we want to run once off and that can last you 20, 30 years. Just make sure that I understand correctly. So. If a country is wanting to put down new rail infrastructure or looking at investigating railway infrastructure, I mean, they might not have the money to, to put it all down and they would have to look at a BOT or, you know, build, operate, transfer. But in your mind, it should be that the country pays, the government pays for the, that initial feasibility study. And then it should go out to market if it's viable for the partners and the investments um, to then tender, for example. Yeah, I want, I want them to open up on whoever the investor is going to be, that this is what we got. We, we, we mustn't go and, and, and search for things and go and really look into this stuff. I mean, it should be on their the database. Everything should be there. I mean, if you're a proper railway country uh, or a railway operator, then you would have had that all on your database day by day. And you know, the amount of tonnage is going over, the amount of export you're doing, the amount of mines you got open, uh, all of that you should have in your pocket by the time that people ask for it. It's not the thing that you, you must go look all of a sudden now there's a contract coming up 
uh, you should know the, the condition of your railway line. You should know the amount of traffic going over there. That should be an annual thing or a six or a three month thing that's been put onto data that you must have. Just pull up the, open the drawer and say, yeah, it is. Okay, so taking that into consideration, there are some, there are some countries who are looking to put down new infrastructure. So they haven't necessarily had a railway or if they had a railway, it doesn't work anymore. So they're looking at putting down a new track. Nine times out of 10, um, they don't know what the potential volumes would be. They don't know if it is feasible. I mean, where I sit, I go, are you crazy? Just put the line down, the tonnages will come. But how, how, does, an, how does a country then go and put all that information together? Because I see the tenders come out looking for feasibility studies. How come they don't have that capacity sitting within their Department of Transport or sitting within their finance and planning and infrastructure departments? And then adding on to that, those volumes are based on mining commodities. So why are the Department of Transport, the Department of Economics, Department of Planning and, and the Department of Mining not coordinating the function because ultimately that each has to serve for the purpose of the, you know, the return on investment. Or am I the only person who sees that? Is uh, certain countries that, that's got that. Uh, some of them neglect it and some of them haven't. Uh, they don't connect with each other for what, what must happen in the future. It's just like we, we run a train now, in 10 years time we're going to run the same train. But they don't, they don't realize they're going to open some more copper mines and the, 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 the ships, the, the trucks is not going to carry the same amount of 14 tons per axle at the moment to make it feasible. I mean, then you've got to go up to 20, 24, 30 and therefore you've got a budget because if you if you got this mine and you've got the same old one line coming out of this mine to feed the main line, then you're also not, not thinking because you need, you, you're going to up your production by about 60, 80% and you need all that space for the trucks to stand and the shunt yards and, and, and it's a lot of things involved operation wise. Uh, everything, it's just a view for the front. It's a view in front. It's not a view like day by day by day by day. It's got a plan that you've got to put together for yourself irrespective if you're going to upgrade now or you're going to put a new line down or whatever. It needs to be there already. People thinking ahead of what must do, must, what must be done to their railways at the end of the day to export stuff as to the full potential.